so that means no one can go in, so I think we're about to start. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Brent and he's well and we're going to talk about Google SEO pitfalls and how to solve them. Uh, during the yeah, time we work on Drupal, we noticed a lot of SEO issues and during the session we'll go over them, the most common of them, and try to go over solutions to them. So, I'm Brent. And I'm Walter. I am a Drupal developer at Drop Solids and I've been a speaker at a couple of uh, Drupal events and already Drupal Jam as well during the pandemic. As I said, I'm Walter, I'm an SEO strategist and evangelist at Drop Solids and again in Belgium and I've been a speaker at multiple Drupal events throughout the years as well. So I'm glad to share um, SEO insights with you today. Yeah. As you can see, we have a lot to cover during the session, so let's get the right straight in. So, the first topic we would like to talk about is public entities. Uh, so, by default, uh, wait, this was, this was your... Uh, yeah, by default, let me start. By default, public entities, so every entity might be available on their own public URL. So, let's say you have a team member content type, every team member might be an entity that's available on their own separate node on, on the internet, have their own section on the internet on your website. And maybe you don't need every team member to have their specific detail page, so their own note. So maybe you only use the team member content type to show an overview of everybody in the team, but you don't have a detail page for everyone. By default, Drupal will generate an entity or, or a publicly available page for each team member. That's an issue SEO-wise. So you don't want all those empty pages to show up on your website because Google has to crawl them and they don't contain any content. So why would you have them online on your website? Um, this results in low value content or thin content as Google calls it itself and as I said you don't want them on your website because they are a waste of Google's resources, Google crawls pages on your website, a certain amount of pages per day, that's, that's called the crawl budget and you don't want to waste Google's resources so you want to um, optimize your crawl budget whatever you can. You can do that by no indexing or just making sure these pages don't exist on your website. Yeah, well luckily the Solution here is pretty easy. Uh, if you install the Rapsol module, you can set up those pages to be not indexable. So you can redirect them to the overview page or just display a page not found or access the night, and that way that issue is fixed. Yes, that way Google can crawl those separate entity pages and then you have no issues. So that's solved then. Next up, slightly related, all pages should be an entity. Um, so often, some pages on your website could be generated based on other content throughout your website. A pretty easy example of that is a home page. Oftentimes, a home page is coded based on elements that are picked from other content types on the website. Maybe a news overview, maybe the team member overview, anything else, maybe a slider at the top that's fixed in content. And maybe that home page or other pages are not editable as a separate node or as a separate entity um, in the backend. Now, if that page is not easily editable in the backend, then your web editors or your web administrators or your content editors, they will not be able to edit the meta tags, edit the page title, or edit anything else that might be uh, important to edit SEO-wise. So you want every page to be editable as it were a reg regular page. Yeah, so instead of creating your yeah, your page in code with a menu hook or stuff, or running file, it's easier to create a page with layout builder, if you have it, and add a block with the content you want to display on that page. That way the client can easily add things above or below the generated content and can just edit the meta tags and it works all out of the box. If you're not using layout builder, of course, the other solution is paragraphs. Uh, and in there you can use block fields or overview fields to create a field where you load in a block or something else and just, yeah, the same principle as the ad builder with, with, with paragraphs. So this will make sure that all your pages are editable and your content editors will be happy people because they will be able to update all the meta tags they want. Next thing we can talk about is indexable internal search. Now by default, if you have an internal search on your website, by default the search result pages of that in internal search, they will be indexable by Google. Um, but again, this results in low value or thin content by Google and you do not want these in the index. 
because if you can let your internal search be indexed by Google, then you have actually an infinite amount of pages on your website because you can input any search term and it will show a search result page and that page will be able to be indexed by Google. That's also thin content. It's not a good user experience. If you search for something in Google, you click on search result and you land on an internal search results page. So it's just not a good user experience, which is why Google uh, implicitly mentions it in its guidelines as well. Do not have these thin content pages. So the best thing there is to make sure those pages are not indexable. Yeah. If you listen to our previous steps, the solution to this is very simple. So if you use a page for your overview pages, in the sidebar if you have meta tags enabled and a meta tags field on your nodes, then you can just prevent the search engines from indexing this page and prevent the search engine from following links to this page. So just click those on and then it's fixed. If you didn't listen to our previous steps and you use a view stage, then you can also do it, but then you need meta tags and a submodule meta tags views to set up the same things but in the view. So that's something the client cannot change. So it's both possible, but if you use a page for overviews, then it's a lot easier. Yes. Next up, something we see a lot of times um, index test environments or staging environments. So we know that may, mainly in the bigger development teams, maybe for freelancers it's not exactly the same thing, but like, again, for bigger developer teams, there might be a lot of different environments a dev environment, a staging environment, maybe a live staging environment, maybe another testing environment. One site can have three, four or more environments and you do not want those environments to get indexed by Google. Of course, it makes sense if you have an e-commerce store online and your testing environment uh, makes it possible for people to order without actually paying, you do not want those orders to come through. You do not want people to search for a product in Google, land on your staging environment and then browse on your website and just buy, buy stuff for free. You do not want that to happen. So you don't want these things, these environments or temporary content indexed by Google. Um, just for the reasons I just talked about. We added some screenshots of examples of this, so you can easily just search in Google for a site, then enter site, and then in the URL enter prod or staging or dev or anything like that, and you will get a list of pages that are indexed by Google that are often that shouldn't be indexed, let's put it that way. So there's a solution for this again. Yeah, uh, well, first, another solution if you add the test page on a live environment. Of course, it's yeah more difficult to block that up. For that, you can just prevent search engines from indexing this page. It's also a setting on the right most of the times. Uh, or unpublish it or delete it, that's of course better. For a complete environment, like a dev or staging environment, it's better to protect it with HTTP passwords. So that's something you can set up in your HTTP access file. Or you can just install the shield module and figure out that way. That's the best way, period to block off a data station environment. Yeah, so this is something we really want to emphasize. You should never assume that Google won't index your staging environment because while well, we don't link to our staging, so how will Google know about our staging? Just actively make sure Google cannot index those environments because somehow we always notice that somehow they get indexed for some reason if you're not blocking them off. So the HD access it is a bit of more work than to just leave it on there and assume that Google won't crawl it but it's really important to actively block it off and make sure it doesn't get indexed because we've seen far too many problems with that. You could also, just as a follow-up, you could, um, I don't know if everybody knows Google Search Console, just short, it's a free tool by Google to keep an eye on how Google is indexing your website, which pages are getting indexed, which ones aren't getting indexed. Without delving into too much detail, you can enter your um, domain property in Google Search Console and validate it so that you are a verified owner and Google will tell you which pages on that domain or any subdomain are indexed. So that's a very quick way to notice if you have a subdomain, for example, dev.yourdomain.com, then you will instantly see all those pages showing up in Google Search Console. So that's a very easy tool to install, it takes only five minutes and then you can follow up if those pages are getting indexed and how many people actually are landing on those pages or clicking through from Google. So even if they are indexed, you can see, well, only two people per day are getting on those pages. Maybe I don't want to put in the effort to fix it. But if you notice, well, every day hundreds of people are landing on those staging environments, then you know you have a problem on your hands. So it's a good way to follow up. 
Next, let's talk a bit about assets being blocked by robots.txt. So, sometimes assets that are actively used on your website, uh, for example, copycons or logos in your header or footer, sometimes they are located within a folder that is blocked in robots.txt. Uh, for example, you can see here on the screenshot, it, it's a bit out of it, but it's a, a couple of disallow rules uh, which shows the profile scripts and teams folder as well beneath that. The most important that you can't see in there is the disallow of the teams folder, where most of the times all the yeah, publicons and stuff are added. There it's visible. Yeah. So, we want Google to see and understand our website and all the pages as a regular visitor would see the pages. So we want Google to be able to download and crawl all the images that are used on our website, or all the assets, all the CSS files, all the JavaScript files, icons, JPEGs, anything at all. Um, so we want to make sure that every file we use on the website that the visitor downloads or client requests, that Google can request that file as well. You do not want to block them from robots.txt. Over here, there's some screenshots. Um, we are uploading this presentation. You can download it via bit.ly slash SEO jam. slash jam, if I'm not mistaken. So you can have a deeper look at these screenshots. And these show an example of a website. I think it's Drupal Camp in this example. It's DrupalCamp.de. And this shows an example of a CSS file being blocked by robots.txt, but it's actually used on the pages. So Google is not allowed to crawl the CSS file, is not allowed to download the CSS file. So it cannot render the entire page as a regular client would render. So it cannot make a complete assumption of how good your content is technically or visually or the user experience wise. So this is a no-go. Um, this is a notification you will see in Google Search Console if you install the tool for assets that are blocked by Google, for Google, I mean. So make sure everything is available and not blocked in robots.txt. Um, just as a side note, when would you block things from Google because robots.txt has its use? Um, you would block things if you have a very big website, and by big website I mean 100,000 pages or millions of pages even. And for example, you are using uh, fast navigation and you are using URL parameters that shouldn't be indexed. Or well, maybe you can just block those off from Google so Google doesn't spend time crawling all those filtered pages, for example. That could be a valid use case. Um, but for most cases, if your website is, let's say, tops 10,000 pages, you shouldn't even think of this. Leave it all open, leave it up to Google what to crawl, what not to crawl. Don't even think about crawl budget, leave it all up to Google. Um, security leaks. Some security leaks could impact um, your SEO. For example, if you allow public file upload, then that could have, in worst case, a very bad influence on your SEO. Could be the case, for example, we've seen this in the past, when you are allowing PDF uploads. For example, you're looking for employees and you're giving them the option to upload their resume. Um, that resume could appear in a publicly available folder and it could be an SEO issue um, a bit further on. So you want all your file uploads to be um, validated through some sort of authentication behind login or using a captcha um, so bots cannot upload files. Um, because otherwise, spammers might just use your form and upload torrents, like uh, a screenshot here. And if Google notices this, that your website contains torrents that are uploaded through a resume PDF upload, for example, then they could give you a manual impact, is a technical term for that. And a manual impact looks like this in, in Google Search Console. Again, I would advise everyone with one or more websites to install Google Search Console on all those domains. If you have a manual action, that means an employee from Google actively lowered your website search visibility in Google. And once you have something like this, it instantly knocks you down in the amount of organic impressions you get, and it's pretty hard to get rid of as well. So if you have a good performing webshop, for example, and you get knocked with a manual action, and it stays on there for a couple of weeks, then that could mean thousands or even millions of revenue that's lost, just because your public file upload wasn't uh, secure. Um, this is some more information about manual action. So there is a very simple solution for this. Yeah, uh, the first solution is to install the captcha. Uh, so reCAPTCHA, simple reCAPTCHA, hCAPTCHA, whatever thing you can do to prevent spam. Of course, it's not 100% uh, yeah, spam proof. Uh, so the second, second thing you can do is whenever you allow people to upload files, think about it like these files, do the A to B publicly available or not, like 
if it's a contact form, maybe you're the only person who needs to see it, then you should be using private files. That way, they are not visible for everyone, and you can view the files just when you look at it. Uh, it's not only for tourists, but also, for example, when you have a resume. Uh, I personally would not like it if I would upload my resume somewhere with my address, my telephone number, mail, where I studied, and it was just out of the, in out of the internet because someone allowed the file uploads and yeah, it's there. So whenever you're developing something with the file uploads, think about does it need to be private, uh, does it need to be public, or can it be private? And always try to go towards private. Yeah. Like Ren said, it's not only SEO, it's a privacy issue as well. If your resumes are publicly available, crawled and indexed by Google, that's definitely a privacy issue. Um, time for a very short quiz. So let's say you have a customer and he noticed um, he has an old website and he has a new website. And let's say he noticed his old website pages are still being indexed by Google and he would like to remove them from Google search. He would like to keep them online just for reference so we can see what did my old website look like, what content did I have on there. So he has an old website that's indexed, he wants it online, but he wants it out of the index. Um, there are a couple of options. We could A, block the pages or entire subfolders using robots.txt, as we just saw. Or we could add a robots uh, meta tag and add a no index instruction for Google. Or we could play it safe and add a uh, no index meta tag instruction and block it in robots.txt. So by show of hands, who would say we will block it via robots.txt? So the first solution. Show of hands. Nobody. Nobody is going the robots.txt route. Uh, B, add a no index. Show of hands. One, two, couple. And then C, using robots.txt and metatech. A couple more, than the majority. Um, okay, so. You would think that is the right answer, but sadly it's not. Um, and the, the reasoning is actually very simple and is a perfect segue to our next section, which is robots.txt disallowed is not the same as no index. So blocking a page or a folder in robots.txt does not prevent Google from indexing those pages. It sounds weird, but it's not because Google can crawl something that it can index it. If you block off a page, but somewhere on the internet there's a link to it, then Google will probably index that page, even though it's not allowed to crawl. So if you want things not to be indexed by Google, you should never use, it, use robots.txt for that, because it's a way to make sure that it will always remain in Google, because if you want something removed from Google, Google has to crawl it to see the no-index instruction. And if you block Google from crawling it, it will never see the no-index instruction, and it will remain on there indefinitely. Um, so just to recap, robots.txt impacts crawling and the robots meta tag on your index meta tag impacts indexing. And those are two very separate things. Um, so yeah, it does sound weird that somebody could link to a page and even though you block it in robots.txt, it's still indexed. And some people also ask me, does that really happen in the real world? Does it happen that you block a folder and Google indexes it? And it actually does happen, if you can see here on Drupal.org, um, and this has been on there for years, and they haven't fixed it. Um, so on Drupal.org, there is a weird home slash slash homepage index, um, and there is no information available, as you can see on the screenshot. Uh, to learn why. And that will give you the information about the difference between robots.txt and the Windows meta effect. <coughs> so we delved a little deeper on Drupal.org, and we had a look on what happened. And let me just add some screenshots here. There we go. So if you look at the robots.txt, at the very bottom of the robots.txt, there's a comment, Googlebot picked up strange homepage URLs. So what are we doing? Disallow slash home. So this just makes sure Google can crawl it, but it doesn't impact indexing. So what they should do is remove this line and simply add a no index meta tag, and that will fix it almost instantly, probably. Next up, let's talk about uh, CLS, which is short for Cumulative Layout Shift. Yeah, so CLS is a pretty new uh, issue. Uh, it impacts the visual stability of the page, uh, and it's actually more annoying uh, for people to encounter it, but it's also something that Google recently picked up to take into account when going to a page. Uh, but an example will show the issue way better. Yes. So let's say you have an order page and you want to place your order, 
We try to press OK, or no, go back. And then suddenly something pops up, so it shifts. And then, yeah, you press submit. So let's see that again. Yes. You want to click on the no, go back. And as soon as you want to click, something loads into the page, everything shifts a bit, and yeah. This is the best forward. <laughs> I'm pretty sure every one of you already has seen something like that, and it annoyed you a lot. So, yes, so that's called the visual stability, the cumulative layout shift. Um, and there are some main causes of this, which you should pay attention to, so you can avoid CLS issues whenever possible. So, for example, here. <coughs> Hero images, big images on the top of your site, if they don't have a fixed height, um, when they load in and they don't have a fixed height, they will shift everything else down, which is a big CLS issue. So try to give everything uh, a reserved space, a fixed height, so even if the image isn't loaded yet, the space is available and the layout is set. Um, some animation in CSS can impact this as well. You should uh, use CSS transform instead of animating the height and the width. Because if you use CSS transform, you're not triggering uh, reflow in the DOM. So if you animate the top or the left or the height or the width, then you trigger a reflow in the DOM, which is a CLS issue by itself. So just use the transform property, and then you only transform that element, and you won't impact all the elements surrounding it. If you have ads loading in, um, this is often the case on press websites that a lot of ads load in as you scroll through the website. This is a CLS issue as well. Make sure they have reserved space. Um, external plugins um, during Corona, the start of Corona, notification bars at the top of a website were very popular, but a lot of them were external plugins and were not negatively coded in the website because they were loaded externally whenever they loaded and they shipped everything 50 pixels down, which is a CLS issue throughout your entire website. Um, and anything that updates the, the document object, so the DOM, after an initial delay, um, should pay close attention to that as well. So nothing shifts automatically. Of course, if you click on something, you can animate it or anything, but nothing should shift automatically while a page is loading. Yeah, uh, the main solution is yeah to think about it. If you're using Blaze or DR image or custom images, most of the time that's not an issue because in the past, uh, some lazy loading of images also had this issue, like the image is loaded, it loads and pop, the image is bigger, but mostly when you're integrating custom functionalities or you're writing your own lazy loader, then yeah, test it very good. Uh, also test it without an ad blocker and see if there's yeah, shift somewhere. And if there is, make sure to prevent it or to preserve some space for the ad or for the image or whatever, just so that it's already the space reserved in CSS and that you don't have a layout shift. Yeah. So. In general, to sum it up, images are most of the time are the reason for CLS issues, so make sure you have reserved space for all your images. Um, and you should also review your pages just to make sure you don't have any CLS issues. You can do this manually if you open uh, ins inspect elements and you go to you emulate slow connection and you reload your page, you will simulate a slow 3G environment, for example, and you will visually see if you have CLS issues. You can also do a lighthouse of it. You can do that negatively in the Chrome browser um, as well. You can also use SEO software like Screaming Frog, which is free if you're not crawling more than 500 pages. So you can definitely use that for free. It crawls your entire website. You can link it with other tools like Google PageSpeed Insights, and then it will show you the CLS scores for all your pages, which is really good if you have a lot of pages to audit. Or you could also simply, again, use Google Search Console and follow up any notifications. So if you think, well, we'll go live, we'll see what happens. If there are CLS issues on your site, Google will show that in a separate Core Web Vitals tab in Search Console. So again, a good reason to install and verify Google Search Console so you can get those notifications. And Google will even tell you which elements sometimes are shifting and causing the CLS issues. So you can fix them quickly. Also, a little bit talking about Google Analytics. Um, so Google Analytics is not really directly linked to SEO, but it is an important tool used by a lot of people to analyze their SEO efforts. So you want to make sure that the data within Google Analytics is, of course, correct data. Because if, if it's completely irrelevant data, then how can you evaluate how your website is doing SEO-wise, for example? So you should always pay close attention to some spikes and drops in Google Analytics, because oftentimes those will be an indicator that something's wrong technically with your website. 
Um, so it could be a configuration issue. For example, if we look at this chart, this is a chart from the old Google Analytics, uh, Universal Analytics, which most people or websites still use today. And we see the amount of page views going up um, right here in the beginning of March, going up quite quite a lot. So you could think, well, this is a very good thing. We are, our SEO efforts are paying off, our pages are going up. But that is not what happened here. Um, so in this case, it was the fact that um, there was an issue with the cookie module. And the cookie module was updated, and because it was updated, it fired the page view event twice. So these are really things to look out for whenever you update something that might be related to tracking, analytics, plugins, things like that. A GTM container, Google Tag Manager that's uploaded, or a cookie module that's updated, a new version, or a completely new cookie module you install. Really keep a close eye on Google Analytics. If you see the page who's doubling, then you have a duplicate page view issue, which happens more than you would think. You can also have the other thing around that the, the landing page is not tracked. So for example, if you have a cookie banner, which you need for GDPR reasons, and people accept the cookies, then you want to instantly fire the first page view. You don't want the fire, page view to only fire on the second page view, because then your amount of page views will go down instead of being a true, true uh, indication of how your website is doing. So whenever somebody clicks on accept cookies or accept tracking cookies, you want to instantly fire that page view, and not only in the second page view. So these are some things to look out for. Um, so especially the session count, the bounce rate, percentage of direct traffic, if you see that suddenly shifting, something is definitely wrong technically. Um, the average pages per session, and then we added the terms for the new Google Analytics 4. Won't go in depth, into depth into that, but in Google Analytics 4, bounce rate no longer exists. But you can look at engagement rate, and there are some other things as well. So to recap, whenever you do updates that could be related to tracking, keep an eye on our analytics data. If something spikes, just review it technically to see what the issue can be. Yeah, and next one, our images. Uh, of course, we all know faster is better, uh, not only for SEO, but also for user experience. Um, if I have to wait five seconds for a page, I've been gone already. Uh, and yeah, most of our content editors are not always the best uh, SEO experts, so they will upload the biggest image they have, like if it's 500 megabytes, they will try to upload it. Uh, so yeah, and that's most of the times not the best case. Uh, but of course there are some solutions in Drupal for it. First of all, yeah, prevent them from uploading a megabyte, 500 megabyte image. Uh, and you can go pretty far in these things. Uh, the first thing I would advise to do is just use the core Drupal image styles. That's the, at least the thing you should do. Like if, if there's 100 pixels width, make sure the image is 100 pixels and not 500 pixels. That's just a waste of yeah, bandwidth. Uh, if you have more time or budget, use Blazy or DR image. If you have even more time and budget, convert it to WebP. Uh, and in the future, future this will be converting to Aviv. So maybe take that into account that that will happen again. Uh, and yeah, check the impression, compression and image toolkit as well. Uh, by default, this is 75%. This is OK. Uh, but you can also optimize it with image optimize. So that's a step where you can go. The first two to three are the most important ones, but you can go as far as you want for that. And of course, educate your clients. Yes, definitely. So educate your customers, educate your content editors, explain them how the internet works. Some people really don't know that a big image impacts your website speed. They just don't know. You have to tell them that, teach them that. And explain them how they can compress their own images as well. So of course, you can rely on the Drupal compression, the native compression, which will speed things up if you have to add a lot of images. Let's say you have a client who doesn't have to add a lot of images, but he wants them to be optimized as good as possible. Well, then you can teach them to use a tool like Squoosh, for example. Squoosh.app is the URL, if I'm not mistaken, which is a tool or free to use online, and it's dedicated to compressing your images. And it's just a really, really good tool. I would advise everybody to go to that website, drag in an image from your computer, and see how, how heavy it compresses the images without any visual quality loss. So it is a lossy compression. It does losses as well, but overall it's lossy compression. So it's just finding the sweet spot, adjusting your quality slider to make, make sure your image looks good visually, but it's also the least amount of kilobytes possible. Because images, they have a big impact on your website speed, especially if you have overview pages with, for example, 20 items, 20 images that have to be loaded in. 
if they're not lazy loaded, they're all loaded together, you want them to be optimized. You don't, you don't want every terminal to be 100 kilobytes, or your web page will be one or two megabytes only by downloading the images, which is really not a good thing. Yeah, and also allocate your front and back end developer because the static fixed images in the team are yeah, not editable by the clients, but are added by you. So if you add it incorrect, then yeah, it's your fault as well. Yeah, you'd be surprised how often a developer asks for a logo at the customer and then he receives a PNG logo. It only needs to be 100 kilobytes wide. He gets a, a 5 megabyte PNG and he just front that rescales it in the header and then every page is 5 megabytes by default. So it happens more than you would think. So make sure your static, your fixed images are good, optimized as yeah, well. Some developers are lazy apparently, so <laughs> that's why they forget, apparently. So, let's go over some best practices that we'll just go over. Uh, the first one, try to aggregate and minify your CSS and JavaScript whenever possible. Uh, if you can do this with your team folder directly, it's also good. And you can also use a module like Adhoc to increase on that. Yeah, so the less HTTP requests, the better, of course. Um, this is the same thing for, for example, maybe a bit out of scope of this one, but also useful to know. Extra DNS lookups, if you have external files, external JavaScript libraries you're loading in, that's an extra DNS lookup, it also slows down your website. These are all very small things, but if you modify it so it's not on an external website, it's on your own, then you don't have an extra DNS lookup, and that's an optimization for all the pages on your website. So, it's a small couple of things can have a big impact overall. Um, but definitely, minify and aggregate whenever possible. Yeah. You can also use the path auto module to generate nice looking URLs for your page. Uh, you want them translated as well. If you have a multilingual website, you do not want some uh, elements in the path and the URL to be in a different language because it might not be good for Google, but also for your users. If they see words, they can read in the URL. That's not a good user experience. So make sure you generate those nice looking URLs. This is a screenshot of the Drupal Jam website. And as you can see, there are a lot of nodes in the URLs as well, which is not a good thing SEO-wise. So, yeah, something the organization can look into to see if, if they can fix some issues there, and make sure they are uh, proper URLs and not just nodes. Yeah, and possibly the second and third one should be a rabbit hole redirected or something, because I see it's from speakers from two or three years ago, so, yep. yeah. Exactly. Um, and here we have the translation issue. So in the screenshot we noticed that we are on the Dutch website, so slash NL, but we can see that some pages contain English uh, words in the URL. Product overview is not Dutch, so that should be translated as well. Of course it's easier not to translate it, but it's our job to make the website as good as possible SEO-wise, then you should translate those words as well. Again, lazy. <laughs> uh, well, of course speed is important, again, so yeah. If you can load your page faster, that's always better. So try to use the Drupal default caching at least. Uh, and if you can go further with Varnish or Memcache or Redis or a combination of all of those, depending on the setup of your site, this is even way better. Uh, and we also wrote some blog posts uh, about some of the things that we are using. So feel free to read those if you want to know more about this. But those go a little bit more into detail. Then it's also important to have, for each page to have a correct and a well-configured canonical tag. Now, depending on the complexity of your website, if you have a small website, it will be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. If you have a big website, it could mean you have to uh, get the uh, help from an SEO specialist. Because the canonical tag, to put it simply, it indicates to Google which page can be indexed, or which page is the main page and should be indexed, and all the other variants or duplicate content shouldn't be indexed. Um, if you have a complex site, then it could be a hassle to get this well configured. There are some best practices. So always use absolute URLs in your metacanonical tag. Always make sure your canonicals that are set in the code, they return a 200 status code. But very, very often we see that a website, for example, is located on www.domain.com and the canonical tag skips the W and just goes to domain.com. And when you then surf to that canonical tag, it redirects you to www. So we are giving wrong info to Google. We are telling Google, look, you don't have to go to the W URL. When they go to that URL, it redirects them to the W URL. So we are giving wrong information to Google, which is not something we want. 
So that's something that happens a lot. So really have a look at this today on your own websites, look at the canonical tag and see if they return 200 status code. And in most cases, you want to commit all the URL parameters. For example, if you have sorting functionality, sort alphabetically or sort by price on a product overview page, and those URL parameters show up in the address bar, you do not want to add them to, the, to your canonical tag. You want to strip those parameters from the canonical tag. What you don't want to strip, however, is paging parameters. Those should be in there. And in some edge cases, you want your filtering parameters to show up in the canonical tag as well. A practical example for that would be if you have a web shop and you sell lots, lots and lots of shoes, for example, and you have a certain type of shoe, let's say white sneakers, and it's a very important product group, and you really want Google to index that separate product group, well, then you want the filtering parameters for the white sneakers overview, you want that in the Google index. So, there are some edge cases, but for most websites, omit all the filtering parameters, just add your paging parameter. Also, some resources, uh, official Google resources, very useful. Um, of course, canonical tags should also never point to node URLs, which also happens quite often, and node URLs in general should just not be indexable either. Yeah, the next one is when you're creating a multilingual site. Uh, so, I don't know how many multilingual sites you make, but uh, for us it's most of the times Dutch, French and English. Uh, and if you have sites, most of the times uh, yeah, the client is also lazy, and they don't translate everything. Uh, so then, if that's the case, you have pages, you're in an English version and you see Dutch content, that's confusing, confusing and it's also not good for Google. Uh, so the first solution is, of course, the easiest, the, the most simple one. Try to translate everything, so that's a job for the client. Uh, but, of course, you don't control the client's uh, sadly, so a backup solution is denying access to the translated pages. That can be done with a module like content language access. Uh, there are yeah, reasons to not do it, but it's less good for SEO. Uh, I think the next slide has a bit more information as well. Yeah. So it's not yeah, ideal for, for reasons. Could, could scare away English speakers, like if they're on an English site and they see Dutch text, they're sometimes go, gone, and Google is also confused. Yes, um, you can also follow up on the amount of pages that are indexed by Google, so the amount of pages on your website, see how many are actually in the Google index. Again, by using Google Search Console, uh, which is very useful, you can see, okay, in this case, Google has 263k uh, pages in the index. So you could think, is that too high for my website? Oh, that's a lot. I only have 10,000 pages. Seems too high. Maybe a webinar setup is needed. Maybe some pages are indexed that shouldn't be indexed. Maybe you have a whole bunch of nodes that have their own separate pages getting indexed, and maybe they shouldn't be indexed. Or Could a search also be, page. Or a search page. Definitely a search results page. If it's not set to no index, all those search pages will inflate the page count. Could also be that it seems too low in Google Search Console that you think, well, my website has 1,000 pages, but only 50 are getting indexed. What happens? Well, maybe you have no index now for some reason. Maybe um, a new environment was pushed and the index was apparently suddenly added to all pages, which has happened to a lot of projects in the past. So when you update your website, always check these things, and Google Search Console is very useful to follow that up. Yeah, uh, make sure your base, base URL is correctly. Uh, so we've seen a lot of sitemaps in the past that have HTTP default in the URL. So that's yeah not really the best practice. So it's best to set up the base URL correctly or set up your cron jobs correctly so that they take into account the correct URL and that you don't have HTTP default in it. So there's a solution in there. And also check up after you go live, just check the sitemap that takes not takes five seconds and then you know if you're correct or not. Yes. This is also a screenshot from Google Search Console, which is showing that the submitted URL is not found, giving a 404 for all the submitted URLs. This is something that is screenshot after the sitemap was updated, and HTTP default was added to all pages instead of the actual domain. So it does happen quite often, sadly. Yeah, uh, so this was a solution in the past. Uh, yeah, either set up your sitemap with uh, the base URL or a bit of problem with your URI partner. I'm not 100% sure anymore if it works for brush 9 or above, uh, so that's, yeah, it's always testing. Uh, just test if it's correct. Uh, yeah. 
And then another important thing, which seems really simple, but it's important. Um, either use the Google Analytics module or the Google Tag Manager module to set up Google Analytics tracking. Don't use both because sooner or later you will come into problems that you have duplicate page use and only after months often the client says, hmm, it looks like I have a lot of page use but they're all duplicated so they have half the traffic they thought they had. So that's not a, a fun talk with the client if you, if you have to explain to them that their Google Analytics for the last five months have been wrong and you have to have every page you. So use Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager. In our experience, Google Tag Manager is the most useful, but of course you're free to use anything. Um, so this is an example of what happened there. So we plotted the page views uh, together with the bounce rate. As you can see at some point, the page views double and the bounce rate goes to practically zero. That's because every page fires two page views, which makes sure that the bounce rate is zero and you have to, the duplicate on the page views. So, it's really not a good thing that things like these happen, but it happens sometimes if you're using multiple modules or there's some legacy code that you didn't look at, so always make sure you review those things and update whenever needed. And that's it. Are there any questions? About anything we talked about or anything completely separate but related to Drupal and SEO? No questions? Well, then I... Yes? Uh, you talked about the uh, canonical URLs mm -hmm. and pagination. Do you know if there is a module for that? Because I think that in standards, I mean, your, your pagination is to be moved from your canonical URL. But if it's that important... I, I don't know if there's a module for it. I know we fixed it for a couple of sites, but I should check how we fix it. Because I don't think it's indeed a module on its own. But I'll try to check later today, maybe, and try to maybe update the presentation or something. Mm -hmm. If you can find it, uh, yeah. Yeah, good question. Good uh, question. Fall back would be, let's say you, you cannot do that for some reason, you cannot um, add the page parameter to your canonical URL. Fall back would be that you create a view all page. And then your canonical can be set to the view all page. And you shouldn't should not index any page to mm -hmm. page. You just have your view all page which contains all your elements that could impact your server performance and site performance, but it is a fallback. If you have a view all page, your page parameter shouldn't be indexed, and you should always canonicalize to that view all page. Okay. But if you don't have a view all, then your page parameter should be indexed in. If I remember correctly, I think we fixed it by, by adding some custom codes to it. Uh, so on our own, another custom module, and another module. But maybe it's a good suggestion to look into it to create the module, or mm -hmm. yeah, to improve on the yep. views, yep. or whatever, yeah. or metrics maybe. Yeah. Yes? You talk about the uh, AVIF. Yes. Uh, like, uh, image optimization. Do you see any future for AVIF? But you said it was not so supported by my browser at the moment. Yeah, the, the support. Is it true? Isn't it the results? Because yeah. WebP is by, is by, made yeah. by Google, right? Uh, the WebP is from Google, yes. Yeah. So, of course, they're actively pushing it. If you're not using WebP and you're uh, adding your page to, for example, Google PageSpeed Insights, then Google will always say, you should use it in a modern format like WebP, of course, because they use it, or uh, they created it. Um, so WebP is by Google. In most cases, if you compare a well-optimized JPEG with a well-optimized WebP, WebP will be slightly better. But if you optimize your JPEGs well enough, for example, by using Squoosh, it will be good enough, and you don't have to pay attention to the, you need a modern image format notification. It's not a must, but you should optimize your JPEGs. On the other hand, you have the AVIF format, but as you can see, there's no Edge support uh, at the moment. There's no Safari support at the moment for AVIF. So they still have a long way to go. But in all the studies that were done already concerning AVIF compared to WebP and JPEG, AVIF comes out on top always. Okay. So whenever the support for that image format will be higher, it's definitely something to look into and make sure that our Drupal community supports the AVIF format because that will be a big uh, yeah, saving space uh, in, in terms of web, web HP. So probably three or four years, or if you really have time and budgets, uh, Alvin with fallback to FB, with fallback to uh, JPEG or yeah, PNG. Yeah, responsive images can get a fallback. Somewhere. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. a bunch of fallbacks, so that's also yeah, yeah. a yeah. solution. This is the support for the WebP format, so as you can see, uh, most of them, if not all, browsers uh, support it, except for Internet Explorer 11, but that's 
lower than half of a percent usage in the yeah. other. So <laughs> you should pay attention to that. Everybody's on Edge or on Chrome nowadays. So, um, so yeah, WebP is definitely something to look into. As I said, it's not a must if you optimize your JPEGs well enough, then you shouldn't have to switch over to WebP, but you could. One more question? Yeah, no, it's more of a comment because WebP isn't native supported by operating systems. Mm -hmm. So for content editors, it's difficult to see what is, yeah. which image do I have? So if it would be something that uh, uh, you upload like a PNG or a JPEG and it converts in your yeah. Uh, yeah. That is the well. management yeah. system. Yeah, I think that, that's the best way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think yeah. the core Drupal styles also has conversion to WebP uh, in Drupal core, I think even. So yeah. So okay. then you can just convert it, and yeah, it's better. Okay, so, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, it's, it's not that long. I think I uh, saw it a month, couple of months ago. Uh, but they have it natively in a. Uh, I haven't tested it yet. I think because we had another solution in the past. So yeah. Something to look into. Any other questions? No? Okay, then I wish you all a nice rest of your conference. Thank you.